Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 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 We haven't done that in a while. Check your hearing. <laughs> so uh, this is the People's University Ancient History. If that's not where you're supposed to be, you're in the wrong class. <laughs> if you're not on our email list, the box is over there. Uh, next Tuesday on the 31st, John Suvel, who's a historian, will talk about his book from Oxford University Press. It's called Dangerous Ground, and it's about Jacksonian Democrats, the armed resistance of Mexico, the Seminole, Cherokee, Potawatomis, and the resilience and creativity of a slave couple, an enslaved couple named Frank and Lucy McWhort. So that'll be Tuesday at noon. And then next Thursday, the 2nd, Dr. Diener will be back to talk about Greece, part three, Alexander the Great and Hellenistic Egypt. Don't forget to sign our attendance sheet if you wanna to go to the Carnegie with us for a tour of the Walton Hall of Ancient Egypt. And that is the end of the announcements. Now we'll introduce our professor. She's back with us again all the way from Huntington. Uh, some people I heard didn't come tonight. She drove from Huntington, so shame on you. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Maria Marie N. Pereja Cummings, DOC for short, which we are privileged to call her, is a Bronze Age Aegean archaeologist and art historian who focuses on iconography, exchange, and identity in prehistoric Afro Eurasia. She currently works as an assistant professor of classical archaeology and religious studies at Marshall University and as a consulting scholar for the University of Pennsylvania. Some of her most recent work has been featured in Smithsonian Magazine and her up and coming projects on the interconnectivity in the Neolithic and Bronze Age periods were hosted by the University of Oxford in December, 2022. Here she is, Doc. My students don't even cheer for me, so thanks. <laughs> that was really nice. Um, if you weren't here last week, this is going to be a wild ride. So if you were here, welcome back. You know what you're in for. Um, let's see. Did I forget anything last week? Um, I don't. I don't think you guys gave me any homework to start class with today. Hit me. Turn up the mic. Sure. Uh, actually, I. Can move closer to you. Ooh. Okay. Let's try that. A little, yeah. How's this table? Can is that any better? Away. Is that any better, volume-wise? Yeah, sounds better. Sounds better, awesome. Okay, um, yeah, so I don't think I had any homework from you guys. Are there any topics you wanna hit? I can make no promises because I think I overloaded my PowerPoint a little bit. I got excited making it for today. So we'll do our best to stay on task. I love Greece. Is there anything in particular you're thinking, oh, I came here to hear this, hit me. Bronze. The bronze. Okay, we can definitely start. Um, we are going to kind of pick up where we left off, if that's if that's okay. I want to make sure that we do get up to the Hellenistic period. Uh, that way we can be all set up, ready for Dr. Diener when she gets here next week. Um, so we started talking about the Bronze Age. We didn't quite make it to Mycenae. So here we have a beautiful reconstruction of what Mycenae probably looks like during the end of the Bronze Age, or at least during the late part of the Bronze Age. And when we talk about bronze, um, we use the phrase Bronze Age to describe like a relative period. So we're talking about the period in which they used bronze. Before this, we did have copper, we did have tin, uh, but we hadn't put them together in the perfect ratio. In the Bronze Age, we use one part tin to 10 parts copper. Very specific. Um, if you're reading any other, most other, um, I don't know, any kind of uh, publication that's talking about analysis that was done, if you see anything other than a one to 10 ratio, if we're talking about the Aegean, it might not be authentic. I know, we should have a whole class in here on like fakes and forgeries. That would be so good. Oh man, I used to teach a class on it and that was something. All right. Sorry? Mean something that would be sold to a dealer or a Fakes and forgeries? Yeah, so so a lot of times um, we'll have uh, a particular find 
uh, will will spark spark a lot of interest. It will be particularly visually appealing, kind of like our folded arm figurines we looked at last time. They have that minimalist aesthetic. There aren't a lot of, of um, technical forms, technical features to their shape. Uh, and so they are very easy to create fakes of. I know. So when it comes it comes to things like this, um, we most we most certainly need to figure out how to um, share more broadly with the public the types of things to look out for when it comes to fakes, when it comes to forgeries, and how we can sort of better protect our cultural heritage together, even if it's not here, even if it's something from Greece or something from Germany or something from dare I say Russia. Um, okay, so here we go. So we've got my scene behind us. If you recall, I know it's been I know it's been a week. If you recall anything about when we looked at Canosos. You kind of vaguely remember some of the features that we saw in that reconstruction of that big palatial structure from Crete. Um, do you see any big differences here? There should be a couple things that maybe set off alarm bells. On Crete, we're island people. We're the relaxed. Walls, yeah. Bingo, the defensive walls. Holy moly, these things got big and they got big fast, right? So here we're looking primarily again at that later period. We are after the eruption that we finished up with last week. Um, and this is, I mean, it's one really great way that we can at least kind of show um, a difference between the two types of cultures. Now what I'm zooming in on here for you is the lion's gate. It gets its name because we've got these two critters on either side of a pillar. Someone looked at it and said, oh yes, those are lions. But can you think of any other critters? Dogs. Could be dogs. I mean, we don't have their heads. Leopards. Leopards. Could be leopards, some other kind of big cat. Hey. Panthers. Could be panther big cats, yeah. I'm going to do one better. What would be even scarier than a natural predator? A supernatural predator. Could <laughs> you guys are on fire tonight. <laughs> Did you drink coffee before you came? <laughs> um, they could, I mean, I would. I probably wouldn't bet on werewolves. Um, but in the imagery, we do know that during this period, griffins, we don't have wings on these babies, but we do have some representations of griffins that don't have wings. We know in Egypt, we have representations of, oh gosh, I don't know, a leonine body, a female head. Ringing any bells? Starts with an S, ends with a sphinx. sphinx. The Sphinx, yeah. So could these could these be other hybrid creatures? It's possible, but we don't like to talk about that a lot because that would mean we'd have to revise a lot of textbooks. So um, <laughs> while we're while we're on this topic, if you can check out some of those stones, those stones are really huge. Um, that are to either side of this central the central sort of sculpture. Where are we? Did we turn this baby on? Yep, we had to turn it on. Okay, so these big, the big stones to either side of that sort of central feature, um, they're so big that some of the, some of the uh, first people who studied them, I mean, if we're gonna talk about any later classical Greeks who are coming back and seeing what was left over at this site, took one look at them and said, oh my gosh, they're so big. A cyclops, must have, the monstrous, huge, must have been the ones to pick up these stones and put them in place, and so we call them Cyclopean masonry. We still use this term, but it works. It really gets in there, right? You're never going to forget that now that you know the story. Um, so that's a term used for these really, really large stones that we use to sort of set up the architecture, at least the boundary walls at Mycenae. Well, the meaning of these two? Yeah. Guardians? Question mark? Power? If they're lions, I mean, lions have such a long history of, of power and courage and Right, uh, bravery, force. Is this is this is an entrance to the main city at Mycenae. So you would sort of come in, and then right off to your so here's the Lion's Gate, and as you're coming in, you could then process inwards and look over to your right and see a grave circle full of uh, the burials of our ancestors, previous rulers. We're still trying to figure out who they are, but they had a lot of cool stuff, so they're probably important people. What are, this is Mycenae. This is, if uh, if you remember from the Iliad and the Odyssey, well, mostly the Iliad, it's the city from which we sort of gathered people from all over Greece to come rally together with us before we took off and we went over there to fight those dang Trojans. Yeah. And so being on the mainland, uh, it's, it's, you know, not really the laid back island culture with no 
no defensive walls. It's very, it's a, it's a different way of being, um, but still related culturally. So we didn't really get to talk much about animal sacrifice. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you weird pictures of, of dead animals. Um, that's something my students are always really worried about. Um, instead, what we have here is a vessel, which is, this is really cool. We have a vessel that's, that's kind of more particular to um, the Mediterranean, like the, the greater sort of Mediterranean world. And it's, this one in particular is shaped like a bull's head. So I know this is an odd angle for the photo. It's because there's a hole back here um, and there's a hole here. So if you're going to use this vessel for some kind of thing to represent animal sacrifice, we think they may have poured <coughs> wine into that back hole and had it drain out to represent sort of the slaughtering of an animal. Interesting, right? Kind of kind of out there, but kind of interesting. I promise we're going somewhere with this animal sacrifice. Um, it occurred to me as I was driving home last week, I thought, you know, for people who are in archaeology, we hear a lot about signs of butchery or signs of sacrifice on bones or on other kinds of remains. And, you know, you read about it, but you don't often get to see it. And so I figured I'll show you what it looks like. <laughs> so here we go. So in terms of um, signs of butchery and signs of sacrifice, here you can quite literally see the incisions left behind by a sharp implement, probably a knife, um, on this particular bone. And then the same thing over here where we have actually worked our way through this bone and caused eventual breakage. You can see here. Um, yeah, where, where it's been affected by human hands. So that's one example at least, um, and something kind of fun to see. When we talk about um, mainland Greece, one of the things that we kind of understand but we don't spend a lot of time ruminating on are, are burial practices. This particular tomb is one of the most famous tombs from the Bronze Age. Have you guys ever heard of Agamemnon? Yeah, yeah. yeah where do we know him from? He was the king of Mycenae. Bingo. We have this burial just a short ways outside of the city walls. Um, this is supposedly one of the largest burials that we have well preserved. And if you notice, it's covered over with soil. You kind of see the way you walk in there. We've got a little slice away here, but you walk in there and after the entire thing, during and after the, the construction of the tomb, a lot of soil is brought in and it's covered over and it almost becomes part of the surrounding landscape again despite housing, um, a space that's mm, any maybe two and a half, three stories high on the inside. So you'll notice we have this sort of beehive feature. Uh, we've got this really nice beehive shape here. That's really complicated for the Bronze Age. We're used to thinking about doorways as kind of post and lintel, right? You've got two uprights and then we got one big guy that kind of sits across. Um, here, we're working with corbelled vaulting. So we're quite literally slowly working each layer of stone that we lay, working from the bottom upwards, slightly smaller, slightly smaller, slightly smaller. And to support it, we then start putting, packing earth around the exterior, building up that eventual hill so that our rulers are then marked by the natural, la natural landscape. That's wild, right? That is so cool, especially if we think about um, sort of the way, the way a lot of different cultures, ours included, start to consider matters of um, land ownership and lineage. I mean, how proud are we when we can say, oh yeah, this is, you know, this was a hand-me-down. This was an heirloom from my mom or my dad or my grandmother or my grandfather or, or even farther back. Oh yeah, my family's lived here for decades. My family's lived here for generations. It was no different with them. If anything, it was even more important because it lays the foundation for what later Romans, you guys are gonna cover the Romans in here, right? In a few weeks? Yeah. Okay, for what Romans later take really seriously, land ownership is your right to be here. And it starts back here, if not earlier. I think maybe with the Mesopotamians, we can make that argument. Okay, so that was our sprint through the Bronze Age. Oh my God, and we're already 15 minutes in. All right, <laughs> holy cow. Uh, okay, so the Dark Ages. Before we jump into the Dark Ages, which is kind of scary, um, do you guys have any last minute questions about our Bronze Age? Not yet. If anything pops in there, you guys know, stick your hands up. Okay, so I have a little bit more text this time to keep me on track because otherwise, as you saw last time, we'll just be gone. <laughs> well, just, Hit me. I think you should just say a word about the sea people oh, before you get into the dark. These sea peoples? Yeah, We're not there yet. 
<laughs> you guys are so, you know where we're going. You know where we're going. Okay, so we hit this dark age period. Um, the dark ages come after people just, people like to jump to the sea peoples. People like to say, oh, no, no, it was just, it was a long eventual result of the eruption at Akrotiri and tsunamis or of climate change or what have you. People have a lot of different reasons. Um, but honestly, for the most part, we as archaeologists agree, it's just systems collapse. I know, that sounds so anticlimactic. But you know when one thing goes wrong and then something else goes wrong, before long you look down, you lost your shoe. And that's that's kind of how we wound up at the end of the Bronze Age. So we've got tons of social upheaval. After the eruption of Akrotiri, we don't really see the same um, prominence in terms of power in the islands. And I throw air quotes out there um, because the way that we talk about power is different depending on who's doing the writing when it comes to talking about power in the Bronze Age. Um, economic collapse of those islands. Uh, and honestly, the sort of second and third order effects as we ripple outward from the Aegean, those contacts start to dissolve and disintegrate. And then we see sort of them trying to hold it together, but an ultimate sort of fizzling out, right? Um, more natural disasters. I mean, we talked about earthquakes last time. There are a lot of ideas about tsunamis. We have some proof of some possible tsunamis after the eruption of Akrotiri, after that huge volcano. I mean, it was epic. Um, we have changes in the style of warfare. So we're dealing with chariots now. We're dealing with horses now. So if we skip forward to, uh, to what we see here with our sea people during the rule of Ramses III, this is one of the, um, this is an illustration of one of the biggest pieces of evidence that a lot of people like to cite because we know what time period it comes from, we know what it looks like. We still aren't 100% sure who exactly the Sea Peoples were. It's pretty clear that we have bands of people raiding, that we have, um, no, you guys know Vikings, right? Viking, not as, uh, Vikings were people who were, you know, usually farmers, but there's a certain time of year where everyone hops on their boats and goes and, and raids. Viking is a, a job description, it's not so much a, like you don't say German, Viking is not like saying German, Viking is like saying Baker, if you will. Um, so what we see here are bands of people, groups of people, we don't know if it's one culture, we don't know if it's many cultures, who are essentially Viking. They're going out there, they're raiding, they're taking what they want, and then they are disappearing. There you go. I wish I had a better answer for you. We have a lot of different theories about who they could be. They could be early Phoenicians. They could be people from the Greek mainland that we just talked about. I mean, if nothing else, they're ready with their defense walls in case you come looking for your stuff, right? Um, there, there are a lot of possibilities for who they could have been. But one thing is really interesting, that, that most cultures who are, um, who are not withdrawing during the very, very end of the Bronze Age, most cultures who aren't withdrawing to, let's say, the hilltops and barricading themselves in, are um, we find them documenting these sea people showing up. So we can probably bet it's not they themselves who are the sea peoples. I know this is, this is one of those rabbit holes, man. We could be down there for an hour. I'm gonna save you some time though. We're gonna, we're gonna move on. Okay, so as we sort of claw our way out of this dark age, and it really is clawing our way out, we for forget how to do all kinds of really important stuff. This is really similar to what we see later on after the fall of the, the Roman Empire, right? We don't have the time to spend making fancy dancy art. What do we focus on? Not dying. So we lose a lot of this knowledge that we've accumulated in terms of craftsmanship, in terms of long distance trade, things like that. And instead, um, it, it takes us a really long time to sort of get back to where we were. That's what we do during the geometric period. So it's almost like we're starting all over, getting back in contact with our neighbors, rediscovering ways of working with different materials. Um, these, I just listed a handful of contacts that we have out here as we work our way out from sort of the central Aegean region. And it is, it really is just reaching our little fingers out. What we're going to see is gonna have a lot of Near Eastern, um, and by that I mean like Anatolian, Levantine influence. Because, you know, they're our closest neighbor. They're just there right across the water. So one of the coolest things that we start to see during this geometric period is this reemergence, well, reemergence, is a, an emergence of our early alphabet. I know, this is one of the coolest parts of, every part of Greek history is cool, if you, if you ask me. 
But can you guys make out here? They kind of look like little scritchy scratches. If we look, just there on the shoulder. I know it's a little tough to make out. We have what we think is someone trying to copy down the alphabet who doesn't quite nail it. It's close, but some of the, some of the Greek alphabet is flipped around. Some of the symbols aren't quite right. Some of them aren't quite in the right order. Um, and it's done on a vessel, which is called an oinakoe. Oinakoe are, are used for pouring wine once it's already been mixed. I assure you the wine that you drink today has already been mixed with water. In the ancient world, this is not always the case. So here we would use this vessel um, to we decant some mixed wine into this thing and then, and then pour it out otherwise. Um, but in particular, when they look really nice like this, we know that they were given as awards if you win a game or a contest, something like that. So not only are you winning this really cool picture, but you're also winning something that has writing on it. And what do we know about writing in the ancient world? Who can read? Yeah, select groups, usually the people who have the time to learn how to read, right? The cream of the crop, um, or maybe not the cream of the crop, maybe the intermediaries before the cream of the crop. Um, I can't imagine a lot of pharaohs sitting around saying, oh, yes, I'd like to learn to read today. You just have your peasant read to you, you know? Um, so what we see is, is this increased interest in the alphabet. So that here um, on the bottom of this vessel, this is a kylix. It's traditionally used for drinking. You could kind of fit your two fingers into either of these two handles. Um, and you can kind of see how they're almost shaped for your two fingers. So you can lift it and then you can drink from it. We're gonna see some of these that kind of look like masks in a minute, they're really cool. Um, and you would drink, it's like drinking out of a bowl, honestly. And so here on, around the exterior, we do, we see another attempt at writing the alphabet. And it's so, so decorative in the way that it's been added to the exterior of this vessel that you're going to be encouraged to drink a lot so people can see your alphabet. <laughs> Another, another facet of this, this geometric period right before we land in the archaic that's really interesting is we start figuring out how to cast bronze again. And one of the, one of the ways that we do this, uh, or one of the ways that we see this, is in the shape of these little votives. So votives, not like little votive candles you can get at the dollar store. Um, but these are little items that, that could be left as offerings or could be used as offerings, maybe at temples or at other sacred sites. They're um, kind of the way you do, like light a candle if you're in a church these days. It's kind of thought of in a similar way. Um, they're like little post-it notes to remind the deity or spirit or whoever it is that you were there. So we start to see the depiction of ourselves doing everyday tasks. So in the case here on the right, I know it's a little tough to make out, the fella on the right is sitting down and working on sculpting a pot. Ah, pottery is a dime a dozen when it comes to Greece. It's everywhere, everyone uses it. So that, that could definitely be considered an everyday occurrence. However, on the left, I know, I know it's a little geometric looking, that's where we get the name for this period, um, can you make out what we see going on here? Can you identify any of the figures? Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a person with some kind of quadruped. I know it's tricky with it faced the other way. I couldn't find a good picture of it looking in this direction. Whatever it is has a long tail, and it looks like there's a dog attacking it. Smaller dog. And it's carrying, it, I thought it looked like a baby elephant too. Yeah. And then, then I think the reason I thought it was an elephant was partially like it's got a big old head and it's got these kind of large ears. But then I saw these back legs sticking out of its mouth. And we know what are some big scary critters that are kind of powerful you might want to put on top of your entryway gate. Could be griffins, could be... If it's a natural, it could be a lion. It could be some kind of like wild cat. So we still have these ties back to what we see happening in broad and sage imagery, like these ideas, because we're still living in the same region. Now it gets really interesting. This is the part that oh, really gets me. What do you see? Or what are we supposed to see? Oh, here, let me get out of the way. Sorry. Kentaur. 
A centaur. centaur. Yeah, we have a centaur. Wait a minute. How do you, what is a centaur supposed to look like? Because it sounded like a question when you said that. Well, uh, the smaller upright figure has four legs instead of two. Yeah, so we got we got four legs instead of two, but there's something a little wonky with those front two legs. They look like human human legs. Wait a minute, we've we've seen representations of centaurs from all different periods, from a lot of different cultures. Um, I don't know if you guys ever have to watch Disney movies with kids, grandkids, whatever. I mean, we have a centaur in there, right? We know they're horses from the tummy down to include four horse legs. What's really cool about this particular piece is that we can tell that that kind of imagery hasn't been standardized yet. It means that someone somewhere heard what a centaur is, maybe was asked to make a centaur. I mean, you can kind of picture it, right? Some little, maybe there's a traveling group that comes through and tells some myth and they're talking about a centaur and some little kid, oh, what's a centaur, right? And the guy goes, oh, you know, it's half human and half horse. And the little kid, uh-huh. And then runs back to dad, dad, I want to see a centaur. And dad's like, okay, like, let's, let's go down to the blacksmiths, the copper worker guys workshop. Dad goes down, he wants a centaur. What's a centaur? And the kid's like, half human, half horse. And the guy's like, say no more. And this is what comes out. Because he doesn't know. So it's really cool that here we can see something that we really only talk about is this idea of the spread of sort of verbal oral culture, the spread of oral stories and descriptions, these ideas of these fantastical creatures that haven't really been recorded in terms of imagery recently enough for us to know how to share what they look like. Does that kind of make sense? That's, that's such a tiny moment in time. So it's really cool that we have a piece of this left behind that is so clearly depicted because everyone knows those look like human legs. Oh, yeah. Hippie. Did they have horses? I guess they did. They did. Yeah, they did. That's right. Uh, and then secondly, did those figures remind me of those other figures that were flat? These, flat these ones? No. They were my, that girl oh, from last time. From the, where they were laying, they would have been pointed wrong by this. Like they're not fat, they're not the stomach uh, sticking out types of figures. They're still the flat, like, except for they're a little more rounded, but. Yeah, so what you're seeing, so if it helps at all, a lot of times my students sort of like have a meltdown when they see this. Oh, Doc, what time period does this belong to? It, it doesn't really matter. Um, don't tell other art historians I said that. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter because if you look at them, you can still kind of see how they're put together out of basic geometric parts. So the technique that we use to make these guys is called the lost wax casting technique. Basically, they make a little shape, whatever it is, in this case, these two are made out of wax first, and then you sort of stick them in um, a pot of wet plaster, and then you put that whole thing, these, guys, these wax little guys, in a pot of wet plaster, you let it dry, you put that into a kiln so that the wax melts, and now you have a perfect cast to fill up with liquid metal. So you stick the liquid metal in there, you give it a good spin at some point, definitely not with your bare hands, to make sure that that metal shoots into all of the little extremities. And then when it cools, you break it out of the plaster and there you go. Pretty nifty. I love technologies too. Hit me, what are you thinking? Are they both wearing crowns? Are those crowns? They're hats, good eye. But you know, fancy hat, crown, it's not that different. Honestly, we call this, I mean, the, the name that you'll find if you look in a textbook is hero and centaur. I can agree with the centaur part. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the difference between the room with the chair and the throne room. It's a dangerous, slippery slope. Okay, man, we are like hitting it. We are right on time. Okay, so we still have the, ar the archaic period and the classical period. Um, the archaic period is really cool because this is when we start to see coinage. Now this is more developed coinage, this is from a slightly later period, but I'm showing you this just because this seems to be one of the coins that everyone knows about, right? We like to talk about owls. So um, this is an image of Athena, Athena who ruled over Athens. Here's her sort of patron bird, if you will, um, the owl together with some olives. We have an older owl down here, an older um, silver piece, and to give you some idea of the size of these coins, check out our little owl sitting on top of a penny. 
these are itty bitty little pieces. And this is, this is definitely a period where the material was what was valued because it's solid silver, which is a little bit different than the way we treat our coinage today. Just a little bit. Um, yeah, so these are, these are some of the, the token pieces that we tend to be most familiar with. It's also during the archaic period that we start to get our Olympic Games, which uh, if there's ever a bigger hallmark of Greek culture that pretty much everyone knows about, I'm not, I'm not sure what that would be other than the Olympics. So we see everything from foot races to wrestling, um, horse, I mean, horseback, all kinds of things. Um, and then, as you know, at the very end of our Olympic Games, someone is crowned winner with a ring of laurel leaves. It's really interesting because this sort of became a way to draw a lot of people in. This is one of the earliest sort of tourist games. Once we got the games going, there was, there was the allure of tourism, right? You've got a ton of people coming to your town to watch the games, to engage in the games, um, to participate in some of the, the religious activities that are going to go on. Um, and when, whenever there's really good religious activity, I love the way that Greece, ancient Greeks worked. Um, we make sure when we slaughter an animal for sacrifice, the gods, they don't, they don't want the meat. We'll just, we'll just have to find something to do with that. They just want the bones and the fat. So we burn the bones and the fat for them and we keep the meat and well, there are a bunch of people here, we may as well feed them. So there you go. If there's ever a reason to go to a sporting event, it would definitely be for the food. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think much has changed. Um, <laughs> that's why I go to football games. Um, yeah, so so our Olympics sort of served a myriad of purposes, and they didn't really tend to happen in the same city every year. They kind of bounced around between these four different sort of patron cities, if you will, so that we can sort of spread the wealth, spread the access. Um, and of course, there are political levels to all of this, too. Now, I'm going to say something that some Greek archaeologists get really upset about. I hope they're not watching. Um, we have, I know this is Egyptian, we have a sort of emulation. I don't know. How many of you are like younger siblings? You're not the oldest in your family. You remember looking up to your older siblings? They were so cool. Oh my gosh, they were so cool. Like you wanted to copy everything they did, but like if you were like me, you didn't quite get it right. I mean, you tried. Um, so the Greeks kind of looked at what ancient Egypt was doing in terms of statuary, in terms of style, and they went, oh, that's, that's cool, let's do that. So here we see Menkari and his wife um, standing together, very solid pose, very traditionally Egyptian, right? We've got our locked knees, our hands are in fists. They're very sort of um, static. They're very strong, kind of martial looking. Um, and we've got our left foot in front of our right, which is very traditional Egyptian. It's very as an active pose, but a solid stance, if that makes sense. It's supposed to give you the impression of movement, but they're not going anywhere. Um, we also sort of have this breakdown, this little drawing over here. You'll notice there's only one N in canon. This really throws my students off. They're like, Doc, there's no picture of a weapon up there. I'm like, that's because we're not talking about weapons. Um, so the canon is a set of proportions. It's a set of rules that we follow in ancient Egypt for primarily elite sculpture. We're gonna make something that fits this, um, this formula so that it withstands the bounds of time. One of the coolest things about ancient Egyptian art, which I, I think Dr. Diener probably told you guys about, is people from the very beginning of Egyptian history can turn around and look at stuff from the very end or vice versa. I think it probably most often happened the other way around. People from the very end turning around looking at much earlier things. Um, and they get it, they can read it because it's all written in the same visual language. So it's from that tradition, we think, that a lot of Greeks, especially during the very beginning of this archaic period, look at the Greek stuff and go, or sorry, look at the Egyptian stuff and go, man, that's cool, let's do that. And they do. This is a Kouros. Have any of you been to the Met before by any chance? Oh, good, we have, a, we have a few hands. This guy's uh, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, thus New York, Kouros. Kouros means young man. And what we see here is a young, nude, aristocratic male. I feel my students groaning from like hundreds of miles away. They're like, oh, she makes us remember those four words in that order. Um, because it's, it's, really, it's really cool that during this period, um, we know that these were used as grave markers. We know that these were used oof, in some rare cases. Uh, they were used as votives themselves. But this guy is just about life size and he's made completely out of stone. So who do you think probably would have had the time, energy, money 
to create him or have him created. Yeah, the aristocracy at least. So when we say young, nude, aristocratic, male, I mean, we know why we say male, we know why we say nude. So young and aristocratic, um, when we think about the practicality of this hefty stone, how hard it would have been to work. Because remember, they don't have power tools. We're dealing with, or originally we're dealing with wedges, wooden wedges and, and hammers to start to kind of pull these big pieces of stone apart to start this process of sculpting. Um, so what we see really is that Egyptian stance, right? The shoulders are squared off, almost military in nature. Um, his feet are staggered. We've got left in front of right, or right, what is it? Yep, left in front of right here instead of right in front of left. Um, and we see some, some kind of Greek innovation. We only have, last I heard, like 13 of these that are fully authentic that we can definitely testify are, are these Kuroi, these young men. Um, one of the latest versions, so I'm gonna spare you sort of the bazillion in the middle, uh, is known as the Anadisas Koros. And you can still see traces of paint on him. Look at how red his hair was. If you didn't have the chance to see before, um, if you haven't, I don't know, um, the British Museum has a great, has a great um, website when it comes to seeing the, the, what ancient statuary would have looked like when it was painted. It was bright, it was gaudy. You wanted to be able to see it from a distance so your eye could pick out the different parts. So this guy looks like his skin was probably originally painted some sort of like yellowy color yellow ochre or something like that. His hair was red. His eyes look like they may have been red or at least red in an underlayer, maybe something darker on top. So you can really see that staining in there from the pigment. Hit me. So was that done by a commission? These guys? Yeah. We think so. Yeah. So in this, and I mean, in this case, we got, we got really lucky because there's an inscription. So, whew, really good. Um, so you can look at his... Yeah, this is where we see, we see a real transformation from, oh, hey, let's do what the Egyptians did to, we're Greeks, <laughs> right? I mean, there's this emphasis on musculature, on liveliness. I mean, he looks like he could just almost step right off that plinth and just keep going. I mean, I would hope he would stop for some pants. Um, yeah. And then, then we wind up in this awkward situation. So I promise, I promised you a little bit more on fakes and forgeries. Have you guys ever heard of the Getty Kouros? Um, so the Getty, the Getty's out in, in LA, right? Um, they're known for having, having a really large collection. Um, lovely people, they're lovely people, their museum is lovely, they're wonderful people. Um, but unfortunately, when these Kuroi sort of first came to light, we found out that they too were one of these um, types of finds that were susceptible to sensationalism, which meant, of course, that people are gonna be interested in creating fakes and forgeries. And so especially in this case, um, the Met was in the scramble, the Getty was in the scramble, there were a few other museums around the world in the scramble to try to lay claim to this guy, and the Getty got him. And then some specialists said, wait a minute, he looks kind of funny. So if we've hit our pinnacle of Greek sculpture here, right, you, I mean, you called it, right, with that, that musculature in his abs, right, in his shoulders, we can see that there's a real understanding of what's happening beneath the skin. And then we look at this guy, who's supposed to be from about the same time period. Does he look a little wonky? Sorry, it's not an academic term. Does he look not quite right? <laughs> I... Yeah, the shoulders, the shoulders are... Good, droopy, what else do you see? Looking at his abs gives me a stomach ache. He's very triangular shaped. He doesn't really look like he could just stride right off of that base, does he? Come to find out after extended study, some people will still argue against this, but the majority of us are in agreement, this guy's a fake. So the well, this is still carved? I mean, it's it was carved, it was carved, and this is this is what's really tricky. So a lot of our fake fakers and forge, forgers, forgers um, have, have gotten really smart because the what happens to the surface of, of um, marble when it's buried in the soil, especially in the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean, we have really iron-rich soil. So you can imagine iron-rich soil is going to be very orange. It's going to be very acidic. In order to flummox any kind of analysis that's going to be done on like the surface of the marble, 
I cannot make this up. This is a, this is a technique that they discovered uh, when they busted two Italian forgers. They were brothers. Um, they found these huge vats of tomato sauce. I cannot make this up. Huge vats of tomato sauce, and they submerge um, marble, anything that they're trying to create. They just they would just buy an art textbook and try to copy what's in the textbook as best they can. Put it in these big vats. The acid in the tomatoes eats through that beautiful, clean surface, and it leaves the same chemical signatures that the soil does. It is. Yeah, no, it's beautiful work. It's brilliant work. But why on earth you couldn't just sell it as what it is? I will, Well, I mean, I know why, but yeah. Oh, it's stunning. It's wonderful. So I don't want you to think that, you know, we only depict nude men. Um, we, we do. We don't depict nude women really during this period at all. Um, what we do show, though, these young women, they're called Kore, so kind of like the Kuros. These Kore are fully clothed because that is extremely disrespectful. We don't show nude women. But when it comes to nude men, we think of it more as like a heroic nudity, sort of a show of power. Um, with the women, though, we get slightly, slightly more dynamic poses. So what you see here behind me is um, you see this empty socket up here. Um, we're pretty sure, 99.7% sure, that we would have had originally a separate piece of stone that you could slide and lock back into that socket so her hand would extend outward, breaking that very otherwise blocky sort of construction. You can almost see how she was carved out of a sort of rectangular shape of stone, right? Um, and so that would protrude outward. Um, a lot of people have argued that they think these statues of women, these kore, or sorry, korai, are sort of parallels for um, Persephone. Do you guys remember Persephone? Mm -hmm. What do you remember? Yeah. Hades' she wife. Hades' wife, yep. So she's she's the wife of Hades. Anything else? Demeter's daughter. Demeter's daughter, yes. So she's out, she's, I don't know, frolicking with flowers or something, <laughs> and Hades happens to look over and says, oh, she's attractive, she'll be my wife, and runs out and grabs her and disappears underground again um, and says, okay, well, you're, you're here now. You may as well have some snacks. So he gives her some pomegranate seeds. She's going to be down there for a while, and she, you know, she eats them. Um, depending on which myth we hear, maybe it's three, maybe it's six, uh, but it's not, it's not a bunch, um, because you know, if you're ever abducted by a God, don't eat the food they give you. <laughs> I feel like that's a part of every different folky mythology. Don't, don't, if you're abducted, don't ever eat the food, um, by su something supernatural, don't ever eat the food. Um, so Demeter kind of finds out and she throws a fit. She can't find her daughter. She's enraged. Um, and so what? happens, nature starts to wilt, nature starts to die, uh, until she goes to Zeus and says, listen, bub, you're going to go get my daughter back. You're going to beat up your little brother if he doesn't let her go. So Zeus goes down there. Okay, listen, sir, I'm very sorry, brother. You're going to have to, you're going to have to send her home. And he says, oh, it's too bad. She had some snacks. And Persephone, do you have some snacks? She says, yeah. Well, so she can't be let out of the underworld for 100% of the time. So that's how we get this deal where she's, mm, sometimes she's upstairs, sometimes she's downstairs. Sometimes she's up with her mom and that's when we have spring, that's when we have summer. But when she has to go back down there and hang out with her husband, we get the change in seasons. We think this comes from an earlier Mesopotamian myth. I'm just gonna leave that gem right there because I know some of you are gonna Google the heck out of that when this is over. Um, and we think that these young women uh, that we see here were probably young, unmarried, hadn't yet had any children, and so in that way are very similar to Persephone, and these are then their grave markers. So you can see them holding, some people take one look at this and the, the little thing she's holding, they're like, ah, oh, strawberries. <laughs> no, it's a it's an unblossomed um, or an unopened flower, a little flower bud to kind of symbolize that she didn't have the chance to live her full life. It's an interesting idea, and there's a great example of our painting too. Where are we on time? Oh, we got a scoot. Um, I hate to say it. Are you guys? Can, we're gonna we're gonna skip this one. We can come back to that one later. Here's a good one, though. If we're gonna talk about mythology, if we're gonna talk about our drinking, I mean our um, quality time together. If you look at this kylix, can you kind of can you pick out? Can you see the way that we've got two eyeballs? So when you drink out of it and you hold it up to your face, it transforms into a mask. 
But what are we drinking? Presumably wine. And as we continue drinking, we start to reveal the image at the bottom of the cup, which is none other than Dionysus himself. And who's Dionysus? He's our God of wine, our God of partying, our God of altered mental states of all kinds. Um, and so what we have here is an illustration of one of his myths, right? So um, to basically cut the whole thing short, I'm not going to waste a bunch of your time. Um, he gets abducted and he keeps warning the people on the ship, the pirates, hey, look, like you want to let me go. You don't want to keep me here, I promise. No, no, you look rich. We're going to keep you. We're going to get a ransom for you. It's going to be great. Hey, no, nah, you really you really don't want to do that. And after a few of those exchanges, um, he just makes them all go crazy and he turns them into dolphins. And grapes sprout from the ship. How is how are they what are they sprouting? We don't know. And that's kind of the point. It's this madness. I know it's it's weird, but it's interesting. Um, it's a there's there's never really a happy ending to, to these myths, is there? Um, so as we continue drinking, this also serves as a warning. Don't drink too much. If you get to the very bottom and you can see Dionysus, oh, maybe think before getting a refill. And then as you continue drinking and those huge eyes that are depicted on there, I mean, it's some kind of like animal usually that's represented. Sometimes it's a pig. I mean, you can kind of see right with the foot of that vessel. When you pull it up, it's going to be round. Um, sometimes it's a pig. Sometimes it's something scarier. Sometimes we see teeth. Sometimes we don't. Um, but that is a reminder to everyone that you're with. How many times have you seen this mask? How many more times do you want to see it? So it's it's really interesting the way that that, I don't know, we need our phones or our alarm clocks for all kinds of reminders these days. Whew, man, we can work our reminders right in when we're having our, our drinking parties. Um, how into democracy are you guys? You, that doesn't sound like you're very into democracy. <laughs> okay, we don't have to go through the, uh, the intricacies of democracy, so we'll skip over the tyrannicides then. But we will. We will hit the next sort of... Um, ah type maybe of what we see what we see physically happening so we looked at our cool Roy, they're still very static this is one of our first big breakaways from those earlier cool Roy. um we start to see a male figure who's shifting his weight it's not something we had before before everybody was static still holding very still still very upright but here we start to see the hint of shifting weight which is according to most art history textbooks at least not something we see until the renaissance and freestanding sculpture, but we've had it. We've had it in Greece for hundreds of years. There's a, a pose. You guys ever hear of um, contrapposto? Contrapposto. It's the pose of opposites. It's just a fancy term for when you. Um, hmm, do you guys ever go to Starbucks? You ever go to a coffee shop? You see. I mean, usually it's young women kind of standing there in line. They have got their latte. Contrapposto. Mm -hmm. That hip hop, that, that shift in weight, the bending of the knee. It's something that's really, really difficult to nail, especially in statuary, especially in stone statuary. But our Greeks, they get it. So this is our sort of first vestige of what we then see. And as we move into the classical period, we're gonna see this evolve just a little bit more in statuary. We're gonna look at, at a couple bronze pieces. Before we get there though, because we can't talk about the classical period without talking about the Parthenon. We, we know what the Parthenon is, right? Okay, good. Um, in terms of getting us there, we got to take a pit stop at Olympia for one very important reason. So I know this is just sort of a footprint. If you look back and to the right just a bit, just here, um, you can kind of see where the original um, temple was located. This is supposedly one of the largest temples to Zeus in Greece, but we don't have the interior preserved anymore. We do have this nice reconstruction up there on your left. Um, and what I really want you to look at here is the fact that we have a deity seated up against the back of the structure. So you see the way he's back right up against those columns. This is really important. It means you can't walk around behind him because he's a god. This is his house. In ancient Greece, we like to think about temples as houses. I mean, we still do, if you think about it, different traditions today, it's the house of your deity. 
Um, here, if you've ever had to watch the Disney movie Hercules, I'm sure you remember that scene where, where the statue of Zeus becomes animated. He hops up and he grabs Hercules and it's, you know, they have their whole scene. This is what that scene was based on. This was supposed to happen in that temple. Um, and I'm sure some Greeks probably imagined that kind of situation with him just jumping up and grabbing people. Um, by the way, you don't want ancient, ancient Greek deities to know you exist. You just want to leave your offering and have them never know about you because if, if you're immortal and they know you exist, it never goes well. It never goes well. Um, so, so yeah, so this is really important. They would be, they'd be very large. He would be seated. He would be relaxed. It is his house. When you go home at the end of the day, you kick off your shoes. You don't then stand at attention by the door. Right? No, you sit in your seat and you relax. This is really important because as we get out oh, here, some more art, it's fine. Well, we're going to get up here. Here we go to the Parthenon. This is really important because when we get to the Parthenon, I mean, this is, this is something that we consider the hallmark of Greek culture, right? This is located at the Acropolis in the middle of Athens. It's elevated above the rest of the city. It's Athena's temple, right? It's not a temple. I know, if you ever go to Greece, you're gonna have a tour guide, they're gonna tell you it's a temple, and you can throw a rock at them and tell them they're wrong. Because <laughs> it's not a temple. We've had, we've had a lot of time to study it, we've had a lot of time to look back over it. Um, we also had the chance to put it back together because in the 1800s when, um, when there was a little, little, little skirmish between the Turks and the Greeks, um, the Greeks thought, man, the Parthenon, it is, it is this gift to Western civilization, we're gonna store ammo. We're going to start, store gunpowder. We're going to we're going to load it up. No one would ever drop a bomb on the Parthenon. The Turkish would, and it blew up. I know. So we we spent some time putting it back together. Um, but what I want to draw attention to here, so that you can pick a fight with the next person you happen to talk about the Parthenon with, um, which I realize as soon as I say it is a little bit more rare for you than it is for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't get out much. Um, it is the fact that, that yeah, what we're, what we're looking at here is indeed um, a treasury. And I'm going to show you how it's a treasury as opposed to a temple. So at first glance, yes, it looks like a temple. The first two versions of the Parthenon that were built up on top of the Acropolis were temples to Athena. Um, but a couple of things happened. Well, I mean, the Persians happened. So Persians swept in, conquered the first time looted, sacked, demolished the first Parthenon, which we think was made out of wood, predominantly out of wood. Uh, so we rebuilt, we made it out of stone, and, and as Athenians, they're not gonna come back. They just, they did it once, we're gonna be done with them. A few years later, guess what? They came back, they did it again, um, and they took our stuff. And so the next time, thank goodness, the Greeks said, mm, fool me twice. So one of the things that we did was reconstruct, now I'm, I'm Greek now, um, one of the things we did was build this new temple, but with a few really nice innovations. One of these innovations is that instead of um, having this open back area here, open and we can use it for, you know, storing some things. It can be used as another area where we could worship. It's, it's kind of a flexible space. Um, now, as you can see up here in this footprint, we've got doors that are capable of locking. On it, And it's something that as archaeologists we missed the first time around. The scholars at McMaster um, up in Toronto went out there mm, the late 2000s, maybe maybe like early teen 2000s, however you say that, I don't know, 2010 to 2015, somewhere in there. Um, and they looked at it and said, wait a minute, we found where you can attach doors and how you could lock them into the stone floor. This area was capable of being closed off and secured. Well, that's, I mean, okay, maybe we have treasuries, things like that. Okay, maybe, maybe it's not that strange. They found evidence of an attic. You don't put an attic over a temple. That's weird. It got even stranger then when we slowed down and we looked at where the statue was, where the cult statue was. So remember how Zeus, seated, relaxed, up against the back, it's his house. He runs this place. What? is going on. This is a reconstruction. I don't remember who that fella is down there. He's in the consequential. Um, what is going on with Athena? This is, a, this is a reconstruction from Nashville. If you've ever had the chance to go down and see the reconstruction of the Parthenon in Nashville, you've probably seen this baby. She's not sitting. She is ready to rumble. And we know Phidias, the guy who designed her and helped 
put her together, was really proud of the fact that in a pinch, you can pull all the gold pieces right off of her real fast. Would you make a cult statue? Would you make a statue to your deity? I keep saying cult statue. We use the word cult. It doesn't mean what it means today. It just means sort of religious figure. Um, if you were going to dedicate an entire statue to your deity, are you going to say, yeah, that's a, this is for you, except for when we get raided and then we're going to take your clothes? <laughs> no. No way. So what we see here instead, we've got, we have a fully armed, ready for battle, Athena. And she's based off of this sort of image. Um, we have some sketches, some writing, um, some documents that indicate that we think maybe she was loosely based on this idea. This is, this is something that is um, authentic to the classical period. Um, but nevertheless, she is ready. So she's not pushed right up against, if we bounce back here, she's not pushed right up against that back colonnade. She's not seated. She's armed. When you put all of this together, there's one more really important aspect that we got to look at. So I think, if memory serves, it's, it's this guy here. Our altars uh, in ancient Greece tend to be sort of um, rectangular as opposed to something like a big round bonfire, like some of us might think. Um, but there's also this really important relationship between our deity who's inside or our, our statue of the deity that's inside of a temple and the, the exterior of that temple. Um, when you make an offering to a god, you have to burn it because it's that smoke that they get. You have to burn it. It's that smoke that they take in. That's how they, they sort of accept your offering. So we see this in other cultures with incense, like this kind of idea, right? Um, how do they know you're burning it though? It has to be that where you, where you sacrifice, where you burn these offerings has to be right out the front door in the eyesight, in the eye line of that seated statue. Oopsies. Athena's altar is right here on the other side of this wall on the exterior. We think this is an earlier altar that was from one of the previous iterations of the Parthenon, just this little rectangular feature here. As far as we can tell, she doesn't have an altar right in front of guys. It's because it's a treasury, but it's disguised as a temple. Can you imagine being, being one of the Persians running into town? If this were how this were to happen, running into town, oh, we're gonna get them again. This makes three running up there and finding the bare wooden bones of where there's supposed to be a statue. You think you're gonna get all this loot? You think you're gonna be able to burn things to the ground? And well, there's not that much up here. We wasted all this energy. Oh, look, they're evacuating with gold. <laughs> right? The yeah, Greeks are Greeks are no slouches. Um, Okay, so something that if we had more time, I know I'm getting us right up there to the last minute. Again, sorry guys, there's never enough time for Greece. <laughs> Don't tempt me, you'll be here all night. <laughs> um, so some of the things that, that if, you, if you decide you wanna dig a little bit deeper into some of the imagery, because there's ample information out there about the different kinds of statuary, the different kinds of, um, of sculpture that's on the Parthenon. Um, there have been some arguments that say that it's female themed, that we have a lot of stories about either women overcoming or, or women being subjugated. Now, I kind of, I don't want to say I take it with a grain of salt, because if you look at it through this lens, yes, this is true, and it becomes very interesting. So I just want to plant that seed in case you guys go home and you just lose your mind on the British Museum website, looking up all the information about the art from, from the Parthenon. So if you guys want this text, I'm happy to email it to you so that you can look for yourself. Um, we're not gonna have time for these guys. Oh, the stance. We'll have to do this stuff another time maybe. In the last couple of minutes, I do wanna let you guys know, um, a handful of you kind of talked to me or sent me an email over the course of the week and asked how you can get involved or how you can help students who wanna get involved in archeology. span And this is something that I'm bringing to West Virginia to try to help out my students. Um, not just mine, but students from pretty much, pretty much anywhere, undergrads who wanna go. Um, we are, we're basically trying to find ways to help students get overseas. Because if I can be super honest with you, it tends to be people who have money who can afford to go travel overseas, who can afford to go excavate overseas. And when it comes to a lot of the work that these undergrads wanna do, the funds aren't available to them. So what I'm trying to do is start raising funds so they can go, so they can start their training earlier and they can develop their careers earlier. 
Um, this is something that I'm working together with the University of Oxford, working together with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so we're, we're trying to find them the top opportunities and be able to send them to go do this work so that they can turn into people like me, hopefully a little bit better than I am. Um, and they'll be able to come talk to you guys and do outreach and engage with the public as opposed to, you know, just kind of hanging out teaching and then calling it a day. So if this is anything that you would be interested in, let me know, don't hesitate. Um, I, will, I will share my email with um, Sean, and if any of you guys want to continue following up or get involved or help out, feel free to let me know. I mean, the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. So next week, next week we're back with Dr. Diener, um, and she's going to be taking you on the run from the, what is it, Alexander the Great through Hellenistic Egypt. That's gonna be really intense. That's gonna be awesome. I'm really sorry we didn't have time for every single image today, but it, oh, it's always a sprint. Is there, is, do you guys have any questions so far? Oh, so far, it's over. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I know that was, that was a run today. Oh, hit me. I would just advise anyone here, if they go on a cruise and end up walking around the top of the Acropolis, to go to the back end where that museum is. You had a picture of a chorus from the museum. Mm -hmm. And in that museum, the sculpture is all lined up so that you can see the progress over the centuries. And it was one of the most stunning uh, sculpture museums that I've ever seen. It's, it, is, it is, I'm glad you brought attention to that. The, the Acropolis Museum is outstanding. Essentially, there was this deal between the British Museum and, and Athens, I don't know, back 80s, 90s, they, they came to this agreement where Athens kept saying, give us back all that statuary. Give us back all that ornamentation. And the British Museum kept saying, you don't got anywhere to put it. And if you did, it wouldn't be taken care of the right way. Humidity controlled, temperature controlled, all of this. And so Athenians said, fine, we'll build it. If you build it, they will come, right? So they built it. It was state of the art, it was beautiful, fully funded, the whole nine yards. They said, okay, Let's go. Uh, the British Museum said, ah, we got to talk. <laughs> and those pieces are still in the British Museum. Now, I have heard lately that we, I think the British Museum sent a few pieces back, just a few, but they are not consequential pieces. Um, but yeah, if you if you guys ever, sorry, yeah, I'm getting the getting the eyes over here. We're good? Okay. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to dig more into that, no archaeology pun intended, um, there's, there are so many resources on the British Museum website, and I almost hate to send you there just because of that. Um, but yeah, the, the Acropolis Museum also has a lot of resources. They just don't have their marbles back yet to be able to put on display. Hit me. I think it's called the Cori, the Cori. The, the Cori, the, the tall men. Tall yeah. Did the Greeks make? Could that have been dug up in Egypt? Would they, how long would it take to figure out how long would it take us to figure out that it was Greek made rather than Egyptian? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, was it a similar artistic style? Or so I think if it were something that kind of came toward the end of the archaic period, oh, and I forgot to give you sort of the, the hack for knowing when things are from the archaic period. Do you guys see his creepy smile? Yeah. You wake up with this guy standing over you, man, it is a bad day. Right? Um, same thing with his predecessor. He's got slightly less of a grimace, but he's it still looks a little scary. Um, yeah, so that creepy smile, we technically call the archaic smile. Um, and the archaic smile tells you exactly what time period we're in. So if that kind of helps you. Um, but but would we know, if, if a figure were this far along, yes, we would probably know you were Greek. Um, this far along, Probably any Egyptologist, any good Egyptologist who takes a look at it is going to be like, nah, that's definitely not Egyptian. Because it doesn't quite adhere to the very traditional canon that we see, that very traditional style of proportion. I mean, you can break this down. There's a certain number of units from the top of the head to the middle of the waist, from the middle of the waist to the bottom of the foot, from the bottom of the foot to the knee. It is like clockwork. Bingo. And it's beautiful. And we can see how this is this is just constantly, constantly, consistently repeated in elite art in Egypt. So then when the Greeks go, hey, that's cool. Um, they, you know, they try, but it's it's kind of younger sibling syndrome with like, mm, close. And then they go, mm, okay, well, if we can't quite do it, or maybe if we're not quite interested in doing it, we'll, we'll take this on and do our own thing. And that's where we wind up with these guys. Yeah, so you can see the way they change through time. Yeah, if we had five more hours, I'd have a lot more <laughs> images for you. Well, I have two questions. 
Oh, okay. I thought you were like, bye. It's time to go. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Sean. You say arcane. I do. Is that the same time frame that archaeology is starting to be used for indigenous times? No, that's a really good question. So we have, um, when we use, it's going to sound infantile when I start to explain it, but hear me out. When we use words to describe time periods, when we say Bronze Age, when we say Archaic Period, when we say, um, in, uh, Enlightenment's a little tricky. Um, yeah, when we have when we have these particular like word descriptions of time periods, um, we use those terms because it's something that we see happening in the culture, or it's something like with Bronze Age, right? The advent of the use of bronze. Um, or it's, it's something else that's going on in particular. So archaic just means old. Is that where the term came from? Something new. So yeah, kind so. Sarcastic. Well, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I would be sarcastic. Well, how old is that? Mm, it's old. It's archaic. <laughs> um, so it comes, it does come right after the geometric period. But I guess the art is really geometric, and that's how that period got its name. Uh, and it comes before the classical period. So I guess, yeah, what do you have between the classical period and the... The shapes period and the, the other old stuff. There you go. Um, and so it's, it's interesting though because if we look at the absolute dates, absolute dates being numbers as opposed to relative dates, then hmm, you know, the time when we have bronze in one place isn't quite the same as the other place. So um, even though the names might be the same, ooh, the time period's going to be sometimes very different. Yeah. Good question. What was your second one? The second one, I'm asking for a friend because I know. <laughs> okay. Um, so we say 100 BC or BC. Yes. What did, let's take the Greeks as an example. What year was that to them? How did they measure time? Oh gosh. <sighs> I just scanned my memory. Well, the Olympians. With yeah, we we work with like the names of rulers. We talk Egypt. about like events. Yeah. So like in Rain. Egypt. Yeah, we talk about about who's in power. Yeah, what families are in power, so things like that. I'm trying to think beyond beyond things like that. I mean, they didn't really, as far as I can remember off the top of my head, that was a curveball, sir. I Here I am talking about that. art. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think beyond beyond the names of rulers, I can't really, yeah, I don't have a better answer for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I just went over this in ancient Egypt. I'm teaching a, a class on Egypt right now, and I remember... Yeah, I spent a long time prepping that. And, you know, I mean, clearly you guys can tell I go down rabbit holes. So I woke up, kind of came back to my senses at 2 in the morning and was like, what am I doing? Um, yeah. That's the answer I got for you right now. I'll email you. Okay. If I can't tell you now, I'll look it up and I'll figure it out. I'll email you. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions? I know. Today was a little more rushed than our Bronze Age. Sorry about that. But it's still fun. You're still stuck with me. Actually, you're not. Laura Michelle's up next, so enjoy her next week. I will see you guys later. Thank you for being awesome. Check out one of these books. You would be a library. This book makes you look good. Check it out. Take it home. You don't even have to read. See you next week. Yeah. See you later, folks. Here, holy moly. Yeah. <laughs>